When you create a new database, linked database, or database view, you choose one of six visual formats. And each of these formats is best suited for particular types of information and interactivity. So your choice can have a big impact on the utility and aesthetic quality of your database. So let's look at each of these formats and how to configure it. But before we explore their differences, I want to note that all database formats are going to allow you to assign one or more sorting rules, which I highly encourage for all views of all databases. They'll also all allow you to create filters, as well as selectively display and order the properties of your database items. All of these formats will also allow you to drag items out of the database to make them freestanding pages and then conversely drag freestanding pages into the database to make them database items. And then you can also drag items within the database to reorder them. And then lastly, you can bulk select items to delete them in bulk, to move them in bulk, or to bulk edit one of their properties. So this table format is most familiar to users and most commonly used, and it really works well for all types of collections and makes it easy to view, edit, and add items in bulk. So the table is going to display the database's properties as columns, and then the items are the rows of the database. And you can resize those property columns as well as drag them to reorder them. And while you can't specify a height of the rows, what you can do within the three dotted menu of the database is toggle this option to wrap cells. And what that does is if the contents of a cell is longer than its width, then it's going to create a new line. Whereas disabling this feature will cause the line just to run beyond the width of the cell. And then at the bottom of tables, you have the ability to perform calculations on the aggregated values of each property. So by default, at the bottom of the title property, you have the count of the items in the database. And then depending on the type of property, you have various options beneath the other properties. So here you can see that we have a formula property that returns a checked or unchecked checkbox. And at the bottom, we're calculating the percent checked. This indicates the percentage of tasks that are completed. And beneath the date property, we have the ability to calculate the earliest date, the latest date, the date range for all aggregated dates, and so forth. So this is a linked database for our simple tasks database. And you can see here that it has a few basic properties. The title property is called task. And then we have a person property to indicate the person responsible for completing the tasks. We have a date property to indicate the date range during which the task will be completed. A select property is where we indicate the status of the task and then that formula property returns a checked checkbox if the status is complete otherwise it returns an empty checkbox which is useful for calculations and filtering and so forth so what we're going to do is create a view of this tasks database for each of the other database formats with just one exception which i'll talk about when we get to it now let's create a list view of our tasks database. And for your reference, as you practice, all of these views will come pre-configured with my course Notion A to Z, which you'll find linked within the YouTube description of this video. So we'll add a view here and we'll just call it list and we'll choose the list format. Now lists are the simplest format and they really work best when you need to display just a few small properties and make no edits to items without opening them as pages. And when items have short title properties, these list formats also work well within columns. And so the way that you do that is first you'll create your columns using empty blocks or other content blocks and that's going to give you the ability to drag your list into the column. And so you could put columns side by side or you could place them 
next to other types of content. So as with all formats and all views of every database, we're going to want to assign at least one sorting rule to our tasks. So tasks here are best sorted by their date property typically. So I'll go ahead and recreate this sorting rule for our list. And then, of course, you're also going to want to selectively display and order properties. So within that three-dotted menu, we'll choose properties. And for our task list here, we'll display the responsible property. And we'll also display the status. And we'll slide the status property up before the responsible. And what that's going to do is give us our status for each task. And then to the right of it, we'll see the headshot of the person responsible for completing it. And then one last note for tasks is that if you take the time to populate the icons of these pages, it's going to create a really nice aesthetic for your lists. And one really good example of that is my NBA in Notion project, which you can access at go.notion.vip slash NBA. And our next format is going to be the board format. So to create this view, we're going to duplicate our list and then we'll go to that copy and we'll rename it status board. And we will choose the board format. So this is Notion's take on the traditional Kanban board. It groups items into columns by a select property, a multi-select property, or a person property. And Notion is automatically going to choose that property to group by. But if you want to, you can choose an alternative. So you can see here that Notion chose the status property. We have a different group for each possible status, which is what we want for our status board. But if we wanted to group by a different property, such as by the person responsible for the task, we can click on the three dotted menu for the database and we can click on group by, and that's gonna display all of the properties that support grouping. So if we click responsible here, we're going to see that we now have a group or a column for each person responsible for some tasks. But for this example, we wanna to stick to status grouping because this is our status board. So boards are useful when items follow a sequence, such as a sales pipeline, or in this case, a series of statuses. And within this board, you can drag an item from one group to the next. When you do that, it's automatically going to update its status. So if we were to go back, we just shifted design theme from assigned to in progress. And if we go back to our list view, for example, you can see that for design theme, the status is now in progress, whereas previously it was assigned. So dragging a card from one group to the next is automatically going to update its value of its status property or whichever property you're grouping by. And then boards are also useful when items are categorized or tagged, which is the case for the resources database that I include in virtually every workspace. So what that means is I have a group or a column for each category, and that allows me to view all of my resources by category in a way that's really digestible. So as with all database formats and views, you want to be sure to have at least one sorting rule defined. And in this case, the sorting rule carried over from our list because we duplicated it. But if you were to be creating this view from scratch, you would want to be sure to assign at least one sorting rule. And then, of course, we also want to be sure to specify the properties that we want to display within our items. This board displays items as cards and within those cards you can choose which properties to display. So what we'll do here within our status board is display this, the dates for each task as well as the person responsible. And in the case of a board, you can also selectively display and reorder the groups themselves. So with each board, you're going to have a group for the items that don't contain a value for the grouping property. So this no status group 
would display all of the items that have not been assigned a status. And we're never really going to have items like that. So we'll click on the three dots for this group and choose hide. And that hides the group and tucks it into its own little list of hidden groups over here. So if you do happen to have items within these hidden groups, you can see a count of them next to the name and you can choose to expand them. And then you can also drag the groups to reorder them. So ours here are really already properly ordered, but if we were to display our items within each person responsible, for example, and we wanted to reorder those people, we could just drag them. And then because the boards use the card format, this is going to be consistent with the card format of the gallery view that we'll look at here in just a second. And that offers a few additional formatting options. You'll have the ability to resize your cards as well as to add a card preview. And we're going to look at that more closely when we create our gallery. But one more feature of boards is the ability to summarize the values of a property within each group. So you can see this number here next to the status. And when you click on that number, you're gonna see a variety of calculations from which to choose. And if you hover over one of those calculations, you'll see a list of properties that are established for this current database that support that calculation. So if we hover over any of these date calculations, for example, you can see that we have the ability to select our dates property. And then if we hover over checked, then we see our complete property here. Remember, our complete property is a formula property that displays a checked checkbox if the status is complete and otherwise it's an unchecked checkbox. So if we click this, that number is going to display the count of checked checkboxes which is zero for all statuses and then two for complete. And then we also have the ability to display the percent checked, which we did within our table format. You can see here now that we have zeros all the way through each status until we get to complete, in which case 100% of the tasks are marked complete, which is the intended outcome. So let's look next at the gallery format. Like boards, galleries display items as cards, but in a unified mosaic. And because cards don't support text wrapping or direct editing, galleries work best when you want to display your items with visual appeal and make them easy to open as pages, but not edit from the gallery itself. And they're even better when you can naturally apply an image as a card cover, as we'll see here in a second. And for these reasons, galleries are really poorly suited to display tasks. So we're going to use our people database. So from this default table view, we'll add another view and we'll just call it gallery and choose the gallery format. And as with all views and databases, we want to ensure that at least one sorting rule is in place. So we will add a sorting rule, and I like to sort people by the last name property. And then we also want to selectively display the properties within the card. So in our people database, in addition to the full name, we'll display the organization as well as the email address. And we'll drag the email address up and then we'll drag the organization above the email address. So note here that the organization for each person is an item of the organization's database. This is a relation property. So we're relating each person to that person's respective organization. And I've taken the time to populate the icons of the organizations with the organization's logo. And this is gonna create a really nice aesthetic within the gallery and any other format that references these organizations. And so because we're working with cards here, and this applies to our boards as well, which displays cards, we have additional formatting options. We can specify a size for the cards and then that card cover, like I mentioned. So to specify a size for the card, we'll click on our three dotted menu for the database. We'll choose properties. And here we can specify a card size. So I'll just make these small for demonstration's sake. 
Now for the card preview, you can see that we have this blank space above the person's name. And if you don't have a natural use for that space, you can go back into properties and next to card preview, you can just choose none and that'll remove that white space. But in the case of people, and part of the reason I wanted to use this people database is because a natural use for this feature is the person's headshot. So next to card preview, you can choose among a few different options to source that card cover. You can source it from the cover of the page. So when you open the page and you apply a cover to that page, that's going to be the card preview in this gallery view. You can also choose the page content, which is going to source the first image within the body of the page. And if there is no image within the page, it'll just display some of the text. And then if you have a files and media property in your database, then you can choose that here as well. And in this case, we have a files and media property called headshot where I've uploaded each person's headshot. So I'm going to choose that here. And you can see now that we have each person's headshot as the card preview. So for this card preview, you have the option to fill the full space and Notion will automatically crop the image so that the full space is filled. But if you want to display the entire image without cropping it, we can go back into properties here and we have this fit image option. It's just a simple toggle. It's untoggled by default, meaning it's not fitting into the space, but instead it's filling the full space. But if we toggle it, you can see that we now see the full image for each person's headshot and where it doesn't fill the space of the card cover, we just have a white border. But I almost always like to fill the full space. So in properties, I ensure that fit image is untoggled. So for our calendar example, we'll return to our tasks database and duplicate the status board. And we'll rename the copy to task calendar. And then of course, choose the calendar format. So you'll see that calendars display items on a conventional monthly calendar where each week begins on a Sunday, but you can switch that to Monday under the settings and members section of your sidebar. So each item's bar is placed according to a date property and Notion chooses that date property automatically. But if your database contains more than one date property, you can choose an alternative under the database's three dotted menu where you'll find a calendar by option. In our case, our dates property is the only date property and therefore our only option. And then beneath the new button of the database, you'll find these arrows and in between them is a today option. So you can use the arrows to navigate two different months. You can jump forward and you can jump backwards. And then between those arrows, that today option will take you back to the current month. So you can see here that we've jumped forward to the dates that contain our tasks. And when the calendar by date property contains a start date and an end date, then the item is going to span that full duration. So you can see that the bars representing our tasks span multiple days. And calendars really work best when items do span multiple days because otherwise the title cuts off and the bar becomes illegible. So one way to maximize legibility is to make the containing page full width, which we already have enabled here. So if we make this page non-full width, you can see that the calendar gets much smaller. And if these tasks were to occupy just one day, then their titles would be cut off. And then another option is to make your linked database viewable only as a full page. So if we click its three dotted menu at the top, we have the option to turn into page. And then we can only view this linked database as its own full width page. So for any item, you can resize its bar. And when you do so, it'll update the value of its date property. And you can also drag the item to other parts of the calendar to move it and update that date property as well. 
and you can click any bar to open the item as a page. And then lastly, of course, as with all views, you want to assign at least one sorting rule. So in our case, we carried over the sorting by date from our status board. And then you also want to selectively display properties and order them as per your preference. So here we'll display the status and the person responsible and we will switch those values. So now you can see for each item in addition to its title, you can see its status as well as the person responsible for completing the task. And then the last database format is the timeline, which is actually relatively new. And Notion limits the number of timelines that you can create within your workspace. And your limit will depend on your Notion plan. The enterprise plan is the only one that offers unlimited timelines. So to create our timeline, we'll duplicate our calendar view and then rename it task timeline and of course choose the timeline format and like calendars timelines display items as bars but rather than on a monthly calendar you'll see those bars along a linear timeline and the bars will be stacked vertically as rows and then for each one, the horizontal position will be dictated by a date property, which Notion will choose automatically. But if your database has more than one date property, you can change it by clicking the three dotted menu at the top of the database. And you'll see that timeline by option where you can choose an alternative date property. So our dates property includes a start date and end date within that single property, but you can also use separate properties to identify the start and end date of each item. So we might have a start date property and an end date property rather than a consolidated dates property. And if we were to do that, we could toggle on this option here and then identify those two properties, one for the start and one for the end. So at the top right of the database, you have a drop down menu where you can adjust the scale of the perspective of the database. You can view it as granularly as hourly or as broadly as by year. And the default is going to be by month. And then just as we had in the calendar, we'll have these arrows where you can jump forward and backward in the timeline or click today to center the current date and time. And when an item falls outside of the current perspective, you'll see arrows pointing either forward or backward in the timeline. And you can click an arrow to bring that item into the perspective. So these perspective settings that you configure will take effect for first time viewers of this view. But if someone has already viewed this view, the notion is going to retain any configurations that they set themselves, such as changing the scale or navigating forward or backward in the timeline. When they revisit the view, they're going to see their most recent perspective rather than the one that you configured, but if they have not seen your view previously, it's not saved in their system, they're going to see the perspective settings that you configured. So just as with calendars, you can resize items and drag them forward and backward in the timeline to adjust the value of their date property. And of course, as with all views, you want to establish a sorting rule, at least one, and ours carried over from the calendar that we duplicated. And then of course, you can also click on the three dotted menu at the top right and click properties to selectively display properties within the bars, as well as reorder them. Now, in timelines, unlike calendars, 
your properties are going to display horizontally within the bar rather than stacked. And this often causes them to overflow the bar and become transparent and somewhat illegible. So you want to choose properties that are short and generally going to remain within the bar. And beneath the title of the timeline, you're going to see a little double arrow that you can click to expand a table for your timeline. So you'll see that there's a row in the table for each item of the timeline and it will be visible at the same vertical place as the items bar. So if we go back into the three dotted menu for the database and click properties again, we can now see that we have a list of properties for the table along with the bar. So you can choose which properties to display in the table and which properties to display in the bar. And you can choose all properties for each one. The title property you need to display in at least one of them. You can display it in both of them if you choose, but it does need to be visible in either the table or the bars. So we'll leave the title visible for both. We'll choose status to display within the table and then hide that within the bar and keep the person responsible for the task. And just as with the standard table format, you have the ability to summarize properties at the bottom of the timeline table. So given this structure, timelines are really going to work best when you have items that span a duration. And they really work better than calendars when you want to visualize items chronologically while retaining the advantages of tables. When you want to see many items in a single view rather than segmented by month and when you want to see many properties for each item. Within a timeline you can display properties within the timeline table as well as each item's bars whereas a calendar is going to cram any visible properties into those bars which often creates clutter and illegibility. So those are Notion 6 database formats. Like I said, these completed views come bundled with the Notion A to Z course that's linked within the description of this video. And if you hit any snags as you tinker with these formats on your own, feel free to tweet at William Nutt.